Well, good morning. Happy Wednesday to you. It's good to be with you this morning. I pray you're having a beautiful day. Um, it was 79 degrees out this morning with my cup of coffee, and uh, it's just a beautiful day, a little bit on the humid side. And last night, we got just a little bit of a sprinkle of rain, so that was kind of nice too. Although whenever it rains the next morning, I seem to get more bugs, and so there was a little bit of bugs this morning in my coffee. Um, and what else? Uh, just another beautiful day in the Lord here in paradise, and it's good to be with you. Um, so uh, just a few announcements. First of all, thank you so much for joining me this morning. Uh, you're welcome to say hi on Facebook, or if you're joining on uh, later, you're welcome to post some comments. We do get, uh, I do get various things. Sometimes it's posted on Facebook, but sometimes I get stuff uh, outside of Facebook. Um, and some of them is really quite clever, actually. I uh, I wanted to show you. Uh, this is from a friend uh, of the congregation, and um, this is these are some funnies that he sent. And so I thought maybe just to pick you up a little bit today, I could show you a couple of funnies. These are these are actually quite funny. So, a little humor this morning. I thought I'd share that. You know, if you've got humor that you want me to share online, send it to me and I'll, I'll cheer up everybody's day. And uh, let's see, other announcements. This Sunday is Communion Sunday. So if you'd like to come to the communion service, either uh, drive by or, or come in, uh, please do that. People are signing up and it'll be a great day. And uh, those are pretty much all the comments I have. Uh, we are still in uh, lockdown but as I look at the Arizona Department of Health Services numbers, we're not going to go through them this morning, but it has to be soon when the governor starts. I don't know. There, there's, there's forces at play that are even more powerful than I know of. So um, we'll just have to keep everybody posted as to what we're doing. Uh, but we are trying to keep everybody safe as much as possible. So that's good. Um, all right. So 
Uh, we are actually in Genesis 27 this morning. I don't know if you remember, if you were with us yesterday, but um, this is the story of Isaac, and he has a beautiful wife named Rebecca, and uh, there's a famine in the land, so he was going to go to Egypt, but God says, no, don't go to Egypt. I gave you the promised land. Stay here in the promised land. So Isaac's going to stay, but he runs into Abimelech, and um, Abimelech is a king. We, I don't know if we talked about this. Uh, in Hebrew, Av or Ab with a B is father. Uh, Abi would be my father. Uh, Abimelech is my father king or the king is my father or my father is the king. Um, so that's, that's what Abimelech means. It means... Uh, the king is my father, or my father the king, or something about father and king, or my father is a wise king, um, but it doesn't say wise. It's just my father is king. But uh, Abimelech is definitely, he's definitely a guy that is, a, I think he's a pretty decent king um, in his dealing with uh, Abraham earlier. Uh, he dealt well with Abraham, and now he's dealing with Isaac. And what, we, what happened... Um, is that uh, that Isaac is telling everybody that Rebecca is his sister uh, and not his wife. And that's the exact same thing that Abraham did, not only when he went into Egypt, but when he was meeting uh, Abimelech earlier in an earlier chapter. Um, and, uh, and so uh, all the men are looking at Rebecca and saying, wow, she's beautiful, uh, not realizing that Rebecca is is Isaac's wife. They're thinking it's his sister. Um, and so we have this conflict brewing because, uh, well, let's just pick it up in verse eight. We, I think we read this yesterday, but we might as well read it again. When Isaac had been there a long time, Abimelech, king of Philistines, looked down from a window and saw Isaac caressing his wife, Rebekah. So Abimelech summoned Isaac and said, she is really your wife. Why did you say she's my sister? And Isaac answered him, because I thought I might lose my life on account of her. Exact same thing that happened with Abraham, like father, like son. Then Abimelech said, why, what is it you've done to us? One of the men might well have slept with your wife, and you would have brought guilt upon us. Dun, 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 dun. So this is the conflict now, is that Abimelech, you know, who's trying to be a good king in his little kingdom here, uh, Isaac's there and Rebecca's there and he's now concerned that one of his men may be sleeping with Rebecca, which would not be good. And so um, now if I were the king, if I were King Abimelech, I don't know what I would have done. I, I, I probably would be very, very angry with Isaac and kick him out of my kingdom for sure. I might even kill him. I don't know. Uh, it's just, well, I don't know if I'd kill him, but I'd give, definitely give him a harsh talking to or something. I don't know. But, I mean, you got to think this guy's not all there. He's, uh, he's just like his father. Um, but let's see what happens. We'll go back to the text. So this is verse 11. So Abimelech gave orders to all the people. Anyone who harms this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. Wow. So Abimelech is going to do what Isaac's not going to do. Um, he's going to put boundaries and rules around Rebekah. Say, don't touch her. If you touch her, you're going to be put to death. And Isaac planted crops in the land in the same year, reaped a hundredfold because the Lord blessed him. The man became rich and his wealth continued to grow until he became very, very wealthy. He had so many flocks and herds and servants that the Philistines envied him. So all the wells that his father's servants had dug in the time of his father Abraham, the Philistines, stopped up, filling them with earth. Then Abimelech said to Isaac, move away from us. You've become too powerful for us. So it appears that Abimelech doesn't get rid of Isaac. Uh, he allows him to stay in the land. Isaac, uh, you know, undigs all the wells and, you know, has crops and, and uh, everything seems to be going well. You have to have water. You have to have wells in order to draw the water out to feed the crops and to feed the animals. And apparently, even though there's a famine in the land, uh, Isaac is still able to continue to grow in wealth and be prosperous. There's, there's, there's food, there's cows, 
there's sheep, there's goats, whatever it is that he's, you know, he's trying to feed, um, he's able to do that. As a matter of fact, he's becoming so wealthy in a desert that Abimelech is worried that Isaac is becoming too wealthy, that he's becoming too powerful. And you'll remember this is kind of what happened uh, with Abraham and Lot. Uh, Abraham and Lot were both becoming prosperous. They're sharing well water and pasture land. And all of a sudden there's scarcity. And whenever there's scarcity, people always get very, very nervous and upset. But another reason why people get nervous and upset is when somebody becomes too powerful. Um, as a matter of fact, in the history of the United States, we've had uh, corporations get too powerful and we don't know what to do with them. I think the first one that, well, maybe not the first one, but one that it just sticks out of my mind is Standard Oil, right? A Rockefeller who um, learned how to, he did a couple of brilliant things. One is that he managed every penny that he had. He wrote down from early on in his life, he had a notebook that he would carry with him. And every time he bought something, a cup of coffee or whatever, he would write down in this notebook everything that he did. And then at the end of the month, he would do an accounting to see where his money went. And then he would look to see, is there ways I can save money by getting rid of something? So that's how, that's the life that Rockefeller lived. That was number one. Number two is he learned how to process oil uh, to get gasoline and kerosene and make it standardized. And so you would, you would process raw crude oil and you'd have different layers, uh, you know, different types of products coming out of that oil. And he learned how to get everything out of that oil you could possibly want. And one of those things actually is gasoline. Gasoline was a byproduct of the kerosene. They weren't sure what to do with the gasoline. I mean, it was there, it was highly flammable. Um, but what, what Standard Oil really started with was, was the kerosene. Uh, because before Standard Oil and kerosene, people were getting whale blubber to, to light their homes. And um, that was very unsafe. It was an unsafe way to harvest it. People, a lot of people died getting the whale blubber. You know, these sailors were out for a year at a time. Sometimes their ships would catch on fire, all sorts of things. But um, the, standard, the standardization of the kerosene uh, so that it wouldn't be too flammable, but just the right amount of flammability made safety of this kerosene that came out of standard oil um, so valuable. Uh, but he, so he came across that process uh, and then he was austere. And then uh, later on, he controlled every aspect of the, the chain from getting the oil out of the ground to putting it on barrels, which would be on uh, ships or on horseback or what, not ships, um, rail, rail cars or on horseback or whatever to, to get that to the refinery. And then he would, he, every little aspect, he, he grew, you know, grew the wood to make the barrels for the oil. He, uh, anything that he could get his hands on as part of the production process, he would get his hands on it and then he would look, is there a way that I can streamline this process? Brilliant man, absolutely brilliant man. Had so much money that people in the United States started being very fearful of John D. Rockefeller because he was basically the richest man in the United States by far. Uh, and the way he kept growing and, and taking over every aspect of life people started to get very worried about it. Well, who's the modern day Rockefeller today? I'd have to see a Jeff Bezos with Amazon. He is definitely, I mean, he started out selling books online with Amazon and then he started selling other products. Uh, and then he started, you know, he was shipping with FedEx, but then he got his own planes. Um, you know, now he's producing his own goods. I mean, he is literally uh, basically the new John D. Rockefeller that is taking any aspect of the of the whole entire production line, he is taking hold of. Now, there's some huge advantages of this. First of all, if you understand how you can, you know, streamline the process because of, you know, you're going to just streamline the process, you can become very wealthy. Uh, and plus, I mean, everybody's doing, I mean, right now in the pandemic, everybody's ordering from Amazon, right? Um and so he is, the, he is the modern day powerful man. He's the modern day monopoly. And it will be interesting to see. What happened in the, in the early 1900s is that there was this lady, I think she was with the New York Times. I can't remember her name, but she started writing uh, horrible articles in the newspaper about how much power Rockefeller had 
and how he should be broken up because he was a monopoly. And it eventually went to Congress and Congress did break up Standard Oil. Well, that didn't do much good to tell you the truth. I mean, he had, he still owned the majority ownership in a bunch of different oil companies. So his power actually increased dramatically because now uh, he was able to even use the breakup of his company to create different organizations. You have Standard Oil and you have um, Shell Oil and you have Exxon, Mobil, all of, the, all of these companies in the United States that are oil producers, they all came from Standard Oil. And John D. Rockefeller still owned the majority of them. Uh, and, and still he became richer and richer and richer and richer. So it's hard. I mean, it is just really, there's really no good way to, um, to deal with a problem like that. Even, um, even Rockefeller realized this. He had so much wealth. He said, well, I'm going to do philanthropy. So he went to Chicago and he built a college, um, basically gave him all the money for the college, you know, which was wonderful, great philanthropy, great generosity. But if you are, an, if you are the, the president of a college where it's been built for you and you don't have uh, any skin in the game, um, you, it, you don't know how to manage. I mean, Rockefeller knew how to manage an organization, manage money, make the hard decisions. If it's all given to you, you don't know how to do that. And so um, you can't manage the college very well. And so uh, he was constantly bailing out the college with more and more money um, to the point where he realized they were just they were just using him. I mean, they were not <laughs> they were not being good stewards of the money that he gave them. And so finally he stopped, uh, you know, giving them money. And the college, I can't remember what happened. I think if I can't remember what college it was, but it was I mean, it was a necessary step. So he was trying to figure out later in life how to give money away. And the problem was, is that you, it, if you didn't earn the money, you have no idea of the value of the money and it could actually destroy you. Uh, and so he, you know, it ended up becoming the Rockefeller Foundation. And one of the Rockefellers actually ran for president or ran for vice president. Um, anyway, so, uh, and I think the Rockefeller Foundation today probably still has more money than it knows what to do with. And, you know, they're trying. It's the same thing with uh, Bill Gates. Bill Gates and Warren Buffett, you know, billions of dollars into the Buffett Gates Foundation to go throughout the world, you know, trying to solve problems. And it's just hard. I mean, because when you are that wealthy, people um, want to, uh, you know, get a hold of your wealth and, and, and scam you and all sorts of things. It's really, really tough. I, I couldn't imagine being Bill Gates. I mean, yeah, he probably travels around in his own private jet and has great food and goes on great vacations. But but, you know, just trying to to manage all that wealth and try to figure out what to do with it um, is got to be a job in and of itself. And then you've got the alligators at your toes all the time. I don't know. What, anyway, so that's that's uh, Abimelech tells Isaac, you've got too much money. You've got too much power. You need to move away from us. You're too powerful for us. Well, let's see what happens. Um so verse 17, so Isaac moved away from there and encamped in the valley of Gerar, where he settled. Isaac reopened the wells that had been dug in the time of his father Abraham, which the Philistines had stopped up after Abraham died. And he gave them the same names his father had given them. Isaac's servants dug in the valley and discovered a well of fresh water there. But the herders of Gerar quarreled with those of Isaac and said, this water's ours. We've seen this before. So he named the well Essek because they disputed with him. And when they dug another well, then they dug another well, but they quarreled over that one also. And so he named it Sitna. And he moved on from there and dug another well, and no one quarreled over it. And he named it Rehoboth, saying, Now the Lord has given us room and we will flourish in the land. So he goes, he digs a well, there's arguments, and he's like, fine. You know, this is the same thing that happened with Abraham and Lot. You know, we all can't share the same well, so I'm going to go dig another well. You know, digging a well, even today, is not the easiest thing in the world, um, especially here in, in the desert. You can go down two, 300 feet uh, to try to find water. Um, you, could, you could go down 300 feet. You, so you, you hire this well. I actually, I don't know if I've ever told you this, but I actually worked on a drill rig. Um, when I was in college, I worked for a company called Phoenix Testing Lab. And 
I went uh, most of the time, about 80% of the time, a testing lab, you go out with a aluminum can or a, a steel can and you get concrete samples when they're doing concrete pours. And there's a standard way to create a cylinder of concrete. And then you bring it back, you put it in water because concrete cures in water. Um, and then you, um, you, do a, you pull it out, you do three of them. You pull it out at uh, three days, you pull it out at seven days, and you pull it out at 28 days. And each time you pull it out, uh, you put it on this machine that measures the compressive strength of the concrete at three days, seven days, and 28 days. And you plot it, and it'll show you whether or not the concrete's going to meet the specification of PSI, pounds per square inch, that the concrete has. So um, this was Phoenix Testing Lab. and But the other thing that we did was we would take core samples of earth down in the ground to see what the what the earth looked like. You know, was it a loam or a sandy loam or was it clay? You know, just basically, you and you would do all sorts of tests on the earth to see what the compressive strength of the earth was. And um, so I worked on a drill rig. And uh, sometimes, you, it, well, it's just not the easiest work in the world. You drill down uh, to get these soil samples, but you also drill down. It's the same process to drill down to get water. And people here in Vail, you know, have hired drill rigs to go down into the earth and get water, and sometimes they don't get water. So you spend all that money to get the drill rig out there. You know, it might take a day or two to drill down to 300 feet, and all of a sudden there's no water. Um, so they have to pull. And every time a section comes up, so um, really quickly, you put on the drill bit, you go down the length of the drill bit, right, 10 feet. And then, um, then you uh, leave the drill, drill bit in the, in the earth, you unhook the, the machine from the drill bit, you put up another 10 feet, you put in another 10 feet section at both ends, and then you drill down another 10 feet, you keep going down. So every time you go down, you have to add another section of drill bit. Because, you know, th those are sitting on the truck. Now the problem is when you're pulling the drill bit out, you have to clamp the drill bit, uh, take off a section because now it's, there's nothing underneath the drill bit. And if you don't, if you forget to clamp the section, then the whole thing falls down into the hole. And there's really no way to retrieve it except by digging. And um, the guy Fourier, what was his name? Bill Fourier? Dan Fourier, anyway, the guy I was working with, he was the crew chief on this drill rig, um, said to me that if I ever dropped a drill bit, I was going to have to take a pick and shovel and dig it out. So I never dropped a drill bit in my whole entire life, never once. Um, and it was hard manual work. But it, can you imagine drilling? I mean, can you imagine trying to dig a well without a machine, without a drill bit? Oh, my goodness. It, it, I just can't even imagine digging a well um, back 4,000 years ago. I mean, I don't even know if they didn't have picks and shovels. They had, I mean, I mean, you know what tools they had, but digging a well was not the easiest thing in the world. I mean, th look, look outside in your backyard or in the desert and look at all the tools that you have. Like I see a rock that's kind of sharp right there. I might be able to dig a well with that. But then you've got to, by hand, get all this, um, all this material out of the well and try to dig a well. Oh my goodness. Um, so he dug, digs a couple wells and, and they argue over the wells, they argue over the wells. And so finally he goes to a place where he digs a well, nobody argues over it. And so that well is now, he named it Rehoboth. He says, the Lord has given us room and we will flourish in this land. So let's see what happens. Verse 23, from there he went on to Beersheba and that night the Lord appeared to him and he said, I am the God, the father, the God of your father, Abraham. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will bless you and will increase the number of your descendants for the sake of my servant Abraham. Isaac built an altar there and called on the name of the Lord. And there he pitched his tent, and there his servants dug a well. Meanwhile, Abimelech had come to him from Gerar with Ahuzeth, his personal advisor, and Phicol, the commander of his forces. We've seen Phicol before. And Isaac asked him, why have you come to me since you were hostile to me and sent me away? So he finally goes, he digs a well, and he goes to Beersheba. And that night, the Lord appears to him and he says, I am the God. Don't be afraid. I will bless you and I will increase you. And what does Isaac do? He builds an altar and he calls on the name of the Lord. And there he pitched his tent and his servants dug a well. I mean, 
at least you can see that Abraham and Isaac both fear God. Uh, and any time life is going well in their life, uh, when things are going well in their life, um, they build an altar and they praise God. Uh, and that's what they do. Um, they're, uh, when things are going well, it's not hard to build an altar and to thank God for all the things that are going well. It's harder to thank God when things aren't going well. That's when it's tough. Um, it is so easy to, uh, to praise God when things are going well in life. But when things are going tough in life, that's when it's really, really hard. And the lesson of you know, the whole entire scripture of all these people is to learn to get the attitude that when things are going tough in life, that's the time when you need to build the altar. That's the time when you need to lean into God and know that he's with you still, even in the tough times. That's, that's really when your faith, and I call that the times of miracle grow, right? When, when you lean into God in the tough times and God sustains you through those tough times, that's when your roots grow really, really, really deep. And I know all of you have had tough times in your life. I mean, if you're, if you're 13 or younger, you really haven't had any tough times because mom and dad are taking care of any, everything, right? Or maybe even up till 18. But then, you know, you, you, you become an adult and you start navigating life and all of a sudden things don't go as well as your dreams were when you were 13 or 14 or 15. And you run into some really tough issues in life. And man, those are the times when God really sustains you. Uh, and 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 growing closer and deeper and, and fuller with God in those times are are huge blessings, and that's really when the, the root system grows. That's the miracle grow for the root system. So anyway, um, Isaac goes out, and you know things are going well for him. So he builds an altar, uh, and he pitches a tent, and he has his servants dig the well. Um, but we'll see. Isaac might have some other problems in life, but it's not, it's not as hard. You should, you should praise God in the good times and in the bad times, but it's not, as hard of a, it's not as hard of a thing to do it in the good times. It's a lot harder in the, in the, in the difficult times. So then you know, Abimelech comes to him and with his uh, Phicol, this commander of his forces. And, he's, and so Isaac asks him, why do you come to me? Since you were hostile to me and sent me away. Well, and this is curious, right? You're getting too powerful. Leave. And so Isaac leaves. And all of a sudden, Abimelech, you know, arrives with Gerar and Azuha and his personal advisor, Phicol, the commander of his forces. And like, what the heck are you guys doing here? You kicked me out. Well, let's find out. So they answered. He says, we clearly, we saw clearly that the Lord was with you. And so we said, there ought to be a sworn agreement between us, between us and you. Let us make a treaty with you, that you will do us no harm, just as we did no harm, as we did not harm you, but always treated you well and sent you away peacefully. And now you are blessed by the Lord. So now we understand why Abimelech has come. Uh, Isaac is so powerful, has so much, you know, cattle and grain and servants and people that now Abimelech is a little bit frightened of Isaac. And he wants to make a treaty with Isaac because now is the time to make a treaty, right? When things are going well. Um, you don't want to make a treaty when things start to go bad because that's not the time to make a treaty. Uh, you make a treaty in the good times and hope that that treaty will sustain you when things get difficult. Um, you know, the same could be said with God. You know, make a treaty with God in the good times and let him uh, sustain you in the difficult times. You know, don't just... Don't just go to God in the difficult times. Uh, you, part of life is, is having that relationship with God in the good times so that when the bad times come, uh, you can cling to that relationship and you, you'll know that he's not going to destroy you. That's, that's why we go to church you know, and celebrate uh, his love for us and celebrate his love for you know a congregation. That's the why we daily go to him in prayer. That's why we daily go to him in Bible study. That's why we daily do this. I mean, it's it's in the good times where you strengthen that relationship, so that when the bad times happen, he'll sustain you. The same thing with Abimelech and Isaac. It's a good time right now. This is a good time to have a treaty between us. Um, 
So let's see if uh, Isaac takes the bait. Verse 30. So Isaac then made a feast for them, and they ate and drank. And early the next morning, the men swore an oath to each other. Then Isaac sent them on their way, and they went away peacefully. And that day, Isaac's servant came and told him about the well they had dug. They said, we found water. He called it Sheba. And to this day, the name of the town has been Beersheba. So I guess it was just as hard to find water then as it is today. You dig a well, you keep going deeper and deeper and deeper. And then when you find water, it's like this celebration that you want to have. Like we spent all this time and effort digging the well and we found water. Yay! Um, So this is a good day for Isaac. He's made a treaty with Abimelech and his whole entire forces. He's got land and, and cattle and goods and people. And now he has a well. I mean, life cannot get any better for Isaac. Uh, and so uh, the, the, the servants come to him and say, we found water. I mean, this is a good day. This is another day to celebrate God's providence in your life. You celebrate in the good times and you celebrate in the bad times. Um, and the, the other thing I guess I want to say is you just never know when the bad times are going to happen. Like, who knew March 1st there'd be in a pandemic for months and that life would be so disrupted that we're not even sure to go back, that the new normal we know is going to be totally different from the old normal. Um, and uh, how many people lost loved ones during the pandemic and they couldn't be there at their bedside? I mean, how every day that you have breath, every day that you have life, every day that you have relationships of people that you can love and care for, every day is a blessing because you just don't know what the next day is going to, is, you know, I could, I could sign off today and uh, you may not see me tomorrow because something could happen to me. Um, you might sign off today and I might not see you tomorrow because something could happen to you. So the blessings of today, enjoy them. They're a gift from God. It's a time to rejoice in God's providence and his love, to feel his love, in, you know, just all over you. Um, so I think on that note, we'll go ahead and close and then we'll get uh, into the next chapter tomorrow. So let's close in prayer. Dear God, thanks for the many blessings in our lives. Thank you for having a treaty with us, a treaty sealed by Jesus and his love for us. Be with us until we meet again. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so that is today. Uh, thank you so much for joining me. Um, I pray God's richest blessings to you today. And we'll see you tomorrow. Take care. Bye.